As you can see, there's a natural solution to absolutely everything. Um, the solution to the obesity crisis for men, very simple, Hawaiian shirts. The bigger you are, the better you look. <laughs> it's no surprise that Tom Selleck was so keen to play that role in Magnum P.I., when mm -hmm. you think about it. Now, I always call this very simply, the shorthand, the science of knowing what economists are wrong about. And like the tube map, you can master the tube map, you can memorize the tube map, but at some point, the more valuable knowledge is knowing when to take a cab. And in the same way, one of the things we've got to realize is that there are tons and tons of problems which are not remotely to do with economics. This is my wash basin at home. Um, it's been cracked like this for about three months. It's going to be cracked like that for another three months. It's not because of the cost of replacing it. If there was a contactless device above my wash base and I could simply pay £300 and have the crack repaired, I would have done it on the day it occurred. It's actually a coordination problem. It's an order problem, finding a day when I'm at home and there's a plumber available and choosing the sink. If there was some magical means of doing all those things simultaneously, the sink would have been repaired quickly. Not to do with money. Video conferencing, not an economic problem. It's basically free. Why people don't adopt it? One of my theories is precisely because it's easy. In fact, that business people have a paranoid fear of actually looking lazy, so will actually adopt high effort approaches, like getting up at three o'clock in the morning and flying to Frankfurt, simply to look committed. <laughs> um, moist toilet paper, not really an economic problem. Most of the civilized world, the entire Islamic world, all of Southeast Asia, would regard the idea of wiping your ass with plain paper as absolutely repellent. Why don't we use moist toilet paper? Because most people don't. Robert Frank was telling us exactly about this, the night before, although admittedly in a more serious topic, that of installing solar panels. But the same mathematics applies. If none of your neighbors do something, you feel weird doing it. Now, I'm quite passionate about this. Um, but I'm not as passionate about the whole case for moist toilet paper as a man called Reese who directed the Deadpool 2 movie. He actually put a full, my argument is very simple, if you went into the garden and you potted some plants, you got mud on your hands, you wouldn't go indoors and say, oh, I must rub them vigorously with some dry paper. You'd use water, right? For some reason, the human rectum in the West is the only place where this rule does not apply. And Mr. Rhett Rees, who is the director of the film, feels even more passionately about this than I do. Well, I'm going to tell you what the big lie is. Toilet paper. What's so bad about toilet paper? It gets the job done. Does it? Really? Get the job done? All right. Say you wake up tomorrow morning and hypothetically find some fresh shit on your face, your cheek, maybe a little bit in the beard. What the hell? I'm about to be fucking what do you sick. Do, what do you do? Do you go to a bathroom and tear off a piece of dry tissue and rub it around on your beard a little bit and then go on, get on with your day? Go to church, maybe dinner and a movie like nothing happened? Where is this coming from, Look, man? Something did happen. Your face smells like shit, right? So what you would do is you would get some soap, you'd get some hot water, and you would scrub the fucking shit out of your beard for like 10 straight minutes. Are you, you trying could to not scrub it enough. Make me feel disgusting. I'm starting to feel. Toilet paper is plenty fine appetizer. But then Huggies Natural Care Wet Wipes. That's your main course. They're soft. They're moist. They're for babies. And finally, one more pass with toilet paper. Maybe clear out that excess moisture. Maybe treat yourself to a blow and go if you can get you a hairdryer. Just about 30 seconds and do you good. Now, <laughs> does anybody recognize the man on the left? You're forgiven if you don't. It's Matt Damon. Now, why you'd get Matt Damon in to play only three minutes of your movie and then dressed up in prosthetics so that he's completely unrecognizable just to rant about toilet paper, you clearly are serious about this. And we had this brief, funnily enough, from Kimberly Clark. And then they changed their mind and said, actually, before you start worrying about moist toilet paper, it's largely because on the shelf, if you think about it, there's one lot of moist toilet paper and then about an acre of visible space dedicated to dry toilet paper. So the human brain automatically goes, well, that's clearly for like weirdos and people with a medical condition. And defaults to dry, okay? And then suddenly Kimberly Clark said, we don't want you to do that anymore. We want you to do um, factory safety. 
in sawmills. This, again, is not an economic problem. Okay? There are very, very good economic reasons already why you wouldn't want your hand chopped off. Okay? What we did is we redesigned safety gloves to make the wearer feel more vulnerable. What's the effect? Actually, with circular saws, not very big. With hand saws, there's a 20% increase in feelings of vulnerability if you're essentially wearing that. Stanley knife, 40%. There's a great joy about this, by the way. Some of you will have noticed, I make this point repeatedly, no media budget required. The stupid thing about the advertising industry is that creative agencies continue to behave as if they were paid on commission. The fundamental thing we do, which is mixing human insight with creative solutions, can be applied in a hundred places where there's no available media budget and where bought media may not be the solution anyway. The crazy thing is that when we stopped being paid on commission, our muscle memory was so strong, we spent all our time continuing to hunt for paid media clients. As a result, we confined ourselves to, I think, about 1% or 2% of the available solution set where we could be valuable. Because what I suddenly realized is there's hardly anybody else doing this. Hardly anybody else is looking for psychological solutions. Hardly anybody else is looking for what economics is wrong about. I'll give you some very, very quick things about what we've learned, OK? Why might you ignore your sat-nav? Your sat-nav is an extraordinarily sophisticated piece of artificial intelligence, really which will tell you the fastest way, on average, you'll get to your destination. And the reason is that when I go to the airport, not when I go home, but when I go to the airport, I ignore my sat-nav and I go on a back road. Why do I do that? Because in any decision you make in conditions of uncertainty, you've got to care about at least two things. You've got to care about the average outcome, but you've got to care about the variance. Now, in evolutionary terms, High variance, i.e. the small chance of a catastrophic outcome, matters just as much over time as optimization. And an awful lot of the time, I won't go into this because it'll make your brain bleed. Once you understand that humans are making decisions in, an ergo, in a non-ergodic environment, what you realize is that a lot of what econ economists think is irrational behavior is in fact really, really intelligent that what they're doing is often using heuristics to minimize downside variance rather than to optimize average outcome. I hope I'm right on this, Gerd, because we have Gerd here, who's the world. Now, one point, if anybody wants to call out bullshit, please do. I'm totally happy. I'm sure I'm wrong about quite a lot. Um, this explains why humans shared food, because having a constant reasonable supply of food was much more important to survival than having more food on average, but in a state of feast or famine. So the very simple business of sharing, of reciprocal altruism, is explained by the fact that we live in a non-ergodic environment. Economists don't understand this because they think utility is effectively additive. And that suddenly makes sense of lots and lots of things. Why is McDonald's the most successful restaurant in the world? It's not very, very good. It's really, really good at not being terrible. It's a low-variance restaurant. If you're in a strange place and you want something to eat and your most important consideration is, I don't want to get ill, golden arches every time. Not so good for a date, that's what Nando's is for, okay? <laughs> but if you actually want to eat safely with minimal downside risk of significant disappointment or egregious outcome, it wins every time. I think that's what brands are mostly used for. I think the main reason why consumers mostly pay extra for brands is the bias is paying a bit extra but the trade-off they get is lower variance. If you buy a Samsung television, it's less likely to be terrible than a television made by someone you've never heard of. The interesting thing, I think, is that consumers themselves do this variance reduction instinctively. So all of us buy brands essentially based on emotions, the reason for which we don't fully understand. I find that really, really interesting. Now, the other cost of economics I talk about is once you believe in economics, you can't believe in magic anymore. And that's because economics is largely modeled on a science developed by Brian May of, the, uh, sorry, Isaac Newton. Um, and Isaac Newton, quite correctly in the physical sciences, says that energy can't be created or destroyed. And then the economists got hold of this. There's no such thing as a free lunch, is the economic equivalent of the second law of thermodynamics. Okay? Now, obviously there's such a thing as a free lunch. I've had fucking tons of them, to be absolutely honest. <laughs> 
And anyway, it doesn't really matter if the lunch is free. The matter, what matters is that it feels free. And so my point is, in economics, there's no magic. In psychology, there's the potential for tons and tons and tons of magic. Simply by changing the context of something, you can change the meaning. Very few of you read that as Tai Chut. You've all read it as the cat, despite the fact that the H and the A are actually identical. Similarly, you'd be very weird if you read that as A13C. The B and the 13 are identical, but in context, they mean something completely different. If you change the context of something, if you change the focus of human attention, you can make something bad good. This is the famous bus which picks you up and drives you to the airport. Everybody hates the bus. You land, you're a mile from the terminal building, everybody on the plane has the same thought, oh shit, it's gonna be a bus. I've been cheated of my air bridge. <laughs> These people are bastards. <laughs> but a pilot once, said to, once announced, when I landed at Gatwick, he said, I've got bad news and good news. You won't be able to get an air bridge because there's a plane blocking our gate. But the good news is the bus will take you all the way to passport control, so you won't have far to walk with your bags. I looked at my companion and said, hold on, that's always true, isn't it? Suddenly, I reframed the bus from being an inconvenience to being a conveyance. I didn't have to walk past 20 Toblerone stands in order to get out of the airport. I was taken pretty much as close to my luggage as possible. Tell a different story, the meaning changes. We don't act according to objective reality. We act according to the emotions generated by the meaning we derive from the world. And that's not a Newtonian process. So, Again, Robert talked brilliantly about how perception is relative. Perception of colour is context-dependent. Perception of price is context-dependent. If you had to buy an espresso coffee in a jar like Nescafe, for an equivalent dosage of caffeine, a jar would cost about £40. And you'd look at that and go, that's batshit crazy. I can buy Maxwell House for £3.20. But when we put one of those 39p pods in our machine, our frame of reference isn't Nescafe. It's Starbucks. And what the human brain thinks in that context is, well, it's 39p, it would have cost me £2.30 at Starbucks. This machine's making me money. <laughs> this, I think, is one of the most important sentences in economics. Remember, in economics, the assumptions made are that everybody makes decisions in an atmosphere of perfect information and perfect trust. Now, in that mental model of the world, marketing wouldn't need to exist. So if you've ever wondered why your finance director hates you, that's why. He's got a mental model of marketing where it is at best a necessary evil and a cost to be minimized, not a source of value creation. But meaning can create value just as well as factories can. And we all too easily forget this. This is from the Austrian School of Economics, um, Ludwig von Mises. They were kind of kicking around in Vienna at the time of Freud. When he says there is no sensible distinction to be made in a restaurant between the value created by the man who cooks the food and the value created by the man who sweeps the floor, he explicitly means advertising and marketing. The person who actually designs the restaurant, designs the seating, makes sure there isn't an unpleasant smell, does as much to actually construct value as the person who cooks the food. The context in which you set something is as much a determinant of perception, enjoyment and behaviour as what the thing itself is. Now, you can do this, this is why I called my book Alchemy. When they reopened St Pancras Station, there was a PR release, I think it was put out appropriate enough by Freud Communications, which is run by, I think, Freud's grandnephew. And you may remember this, which is that every single press release about the new St Pancras Station contained what I consider to be one of the most batshit ridiculous superlatives ever used in the English language. We were all told that the station had, do you remember? the longest champagne bar in Europe. Now, it isn't even that long. I expected something where I could see the curvature of the earth. Um, <laughs> it's not even very relevant, because when have you ever said, you know, I'm thinking of going to a champagne bar this evening. Do you know where the longest one is? <laughs> or, I didn't really enjoy that champagne bar. Champagne was quite good, but it wasn't long enough, okay? <laughs> but for some reason, it gained human attention and it completely, in one sentence, reframed the station from being a utilitarian transit hub whose only purpose was to get people on trains as fast as possible, and it made it a destination in its own right. And I call this kind of thing benign bullshit, okay? Because it kind of is bullshit. 
But it's important bullshit nonetheless. Because without bullshit, you can produce something which is objectively great, but has no meaning. They spent a billion pounds doing London Bridge Station. I said, look, just have two fewer branches of Oliver Bonus. Okay. Does anybody else understand Oliver Bonus? I th personally, I think oncologists should study the spread of Oliver Bonus, because it makes no sense to me whatsoever. Just make sure you've got the largest florist in Europe. And if the guy makes a bit of a loss, it's 0.0001% of your building cost. But instead, everybody will go, I love London Bridge Station, aren't the flowers great? Okay? But they didn't have a bullshit artist slash alchemist, and so even though it's gone from being the worst station in London to one of the better ones, the level of human appreciation is about 10% of what it might have been if you'd had a bit of bullshit added. Japanese guy actually explained a lot of this, Kano, um, in Kano theory, which is, um, um, apologies for anybody born after about 1990 here, those of you who remember buying cassette deck in the 1980s will remember that there were functional features, threshold attributes that we cared about. Did it work? Was the sound reproduction tolerable? All that kind of stuff. But what really decided which cassette deck we bought was the eject mechanism. Okay? <laughs> If you pressed eject and it went clack, this cassette deck was manifestly rubbish and you weren't going to give it any house room. If it whirred open with a strange pneumatic action, bingo, excitement attribute. And genuinely, adding an excitement attribute is decisive. Dyson, lots and lots of functional benefits, the excitement attribute is that it's transparent. They could have done everything else and made that thing beige and opaque, and I don't think anybody would have paid 500 quid for the thing. I mean, normally vacuum cleaner is kind of a distress purchase. Something there fundamentally changed human behavior. And I would argue it was the trivial novelty of actually seeing the shit you're hoovering up. <laughs> okay? Uber. The map. The guy had the idea while watching the James Bond film Goldfinger, where Bond has a little thing in the dashboard of his DB6 where he tracks Goldfinger's car through the Alps with a moving dot. And a stone Canadian, one of the co-founders of Uber, basically said, that's what should happen when you order a cab. And it's a psychological solution. It doesn't change objective reality, doesn't make the cab any faster. It changes the feeling you get waiting for a cab. It changes the feeling you get paying for a cab because nothing changes hands, so it feels a bit like a service. If you're like me, it also gives you a little bit of an ego boost because you time your arrival onto the pavement to coincide exactly with the car drawing up which makes you feel like Kaiser Soze at the end of The Usual Suspects. <laughs> now, if you can change the story, you can change the thing. We can do this to sell stuff, and that's great. I've got no apologies for that whatsoever. But we can also use it to understand what works in human behavior. J.P. Morgan once said, every man has two reasons for doing something, a good reason and the real reason. Toothpaste. Why do we clean our teeth? If you ask everybody, the official reason is always going to be the same. It's to prevent uh, tooth decay, uh, prevent the buildup of plaque, prevent cavities, uh, and to maintain gum health. Yeah. But let's look at when people clean their teeth. Before a date, always. First thing in the morning, always. After lunch, never. Okay? Unless you're American, in which case you've probably got a flossing regime or something. But basically, every time people clean their teeth, it's about vanity and fear of bad breath, not about tooth decay. If you want further proof, one, the guy at Colgate told me I was right. Two, why else is all toothpaste flavored as mint? If it were about gum health, that wouldn't be the case. But about 97% of all toothpaste is flavored with milk, mint. And that tells me something. You can get people to do practically anything good as long as there's a selfish ulterior motive somewhere in the background. It's not like economics. It's not the fact that actually something we weigh positives and negatives and we'll only do the things that are positive. If we can put a positive spin on a behavior, or if a behavior ties in with some deeper Darwinian instinct, you can create social benefit obliquely. Okay. Now, if you look at Unilever, Procter & Gamble, who until the invention of antibiotics were probably responsible in large part for the reduction in childhood mortality and the increase in life expectancy, simply through better hygiene. Now, if you look at the advertising of that period, what it does not say is wash with pear soap and help prevent a cholera outbreak. Okay? All the hygiene stuff is actually deeply Darwinian and plays on anxieties. 
uh, always the bride, often the bridesmaid, never a bride, uh, was a Listerine ad. Written by a female copywriter, incidentally. Um, uh, again, fear of social stigma. It's a much stronger driver, actually, than the pro-social benefit of let's all prevent a cholera outbreak. And I call this scenting the soap. It's the same as toothpaste, okay? With soap, there's a detergent effect, there's an antibacterial effect, but if you make it smell as well, people will use it assiduously for selfish reasons, and the pro-social reason emerges as a byproduct. Now, one of the things we're going to discuss later on today is maybe it's better if people do good by stealth. Because when people are conscious of doing good, they tend to engage in a little bit of what we might call moral offsetting. Do you remember this? Do you remember, um, those of you who are over 40 will remember that cyclists in London were perfectly reasonable road users until people told them they were saving the planet, at which point they basically became assholes. Okay? So there may be an argument that actually what we want to do is do good by stealth much more. Now, virtue signaling is a great thing. It doesn't scale. 10% of high-status people will virtue signal and benefit. It's similar to counter-signaling as a mechanism, which is if you're an Oscar-winning actor and you turn up at the, at the Oscars in a Prius, nobody thinks it's because you can't afford a limo, okay? It's worth remembering, if you work at minimum wage and you turn up to work on a bicycle, it does not mean this. It means you can't afford a car. And it's no use de developing signaling currencies which don't scale to the whole population. And my problem about the overt signaling of hair-shirted virtue, this is an interesting thing because it's worth over a billion dollars. It's, it's, it's a unicorn. Now, nearly every vegetarian product used the language of self-denial and what it doesn't contain. I think calling it beyond meat, with the implication that this is actually meatier than meat itself, is an accidental or deliberate, I'm not sure which, piece of marketing genius. If you want people to do good things, provided you can have a story about the good thing, which includes some personal individual benefit, I genuinely believe you can change the context of choice, you can change the behavior, and you can achieve astonishing amounts of human altruism without altruism necessarily being intended. So this is one of our theories about train design. Why do people hate standing on trains? Well, if you think about it, okay, quite a lot of people stand on trains and when seats become available, they still stand. If you've got a reasonable place to lean, people are often pretty happy. Now, I'm not talking about four-hour journeys here. I'm talking about 30-minute journeys. But it would be hugely adv advantageous if those people who are fitter and younger could be encouraged to stand, leaving seats available for, well, 53-year-old fat advertising executives, for that matter. At the moment, it's all or nothing. If you get a seat, you get a view out of the window, you get a seat, you get a table, you get a place to put your cup, you get a plug to charge your laptop, and you can work, you can read. If you stand up, you lose the use of one hand, you can't even read a book or use a mobile phone, um, you effectively spend half your time attempting not to fall over, you're worried about your bag, and you don't get a view out of the window. You get zilch. Try redesigning the train so there's a trade-off. So the seats are down the middle and they don't have tables. All alongside the windows, you have leaning posts where you've got a little, a, a little desk for your laptop, you've got two USB chargers, and you've got a comfortable place to hang your bag with a hook, suddenly it's a choice, not a compromise. And I genuinely think looking at the way in which, if you've got a story you can tell yourself in which the outcome is positive and something you've chosen anyway, it's much, much easier to do something. And I'll end on this. The church understands this better than anybody. You can get people to be altruistic, but look for some small selfish thing inside it, if you can possibly find it. When my wife went into the Church of England, one of the people who taught them just said at the end of one lesson, he said, by the way, you're all doing this for extremely good reasons, but don't imagine for one second that 5% of you isn't going into the church because you like dressing up in robes. <laughs> That's me. This is the problem, that any solution that creates magic is necessarily counterintuitive. In the business and policy-making decision uh, environment, effectively, there's a natural aversion to counterintuitive solutions. If you come up with anything that's consonant with standard economic theory, the burden of proof is almost nil. You know, our product isn't selling, so we're going to drop the price. Those things can be approved in seven seconds. If you said our product isn't going to selling, isn't selling, so we're going to put the price up and do some advertising featuring an animated goat, 
you'll be argued to death for the next three years. <laughs> Secondly, if something, it's much easier to get fired for being illogical than it is for being unimaginative. And the very setting, this may explain why large established companies have such a poor record of innovation. That once you're large enough, you essentially create a rational framework within which everybody operates, and the potential to create the magic which made your company big in the first place suddenly disappears. Thank you very much indeed.